Thank you very much, and thank you very much for the invitation and the warm welcome. And it's very clear from the activity at the tables that probably everyone here knows uh, more about interdisciplinarity than I do. So it's always, uh, it's always a pleasure to be um, invited to and welcomed in Denmark, uh, particularly in Danish museums, uh, where uh, very interesting activity is taking place uh, on a socially engaged level that uh, sometimes uh, is missing in uh, other, other countries. So um, today we're going to go on a number of uh, journeys together and some of these journeys will be across continents and between cultures. Some of these journeys will be across disciplines from art and science and back. Some of these journeys will actually involve time travel and still others will involve voyaging into states of mind that are new and unknown for us. This kind of travel is actually possible when we engage with art and when we think with artists, when we come to learn how artists think. And therefore we learn a new and highly productive way of thinking. This way of thinking is both pragmatic and materially prosaic. It's also highly conceptual and often radical. It is rooted in both things and in ideas. It is both concrete and abstract, tangible and conceptual. So today you will have a number of travel guides on these journeys and the guides will probably learn as much from you as you will learn from them. So I am only one of your, one of your first guides today and I have been asked to outline a map that we can use to go from one discipline to another and back again. How to combine disciplines and how to address ideas. How artists and the works of art they make can guide all of us to better thinking. Thinking that is actually freed by disciplinary bases, not confined by them. So, I'm going to begin to draw this map at a place and an image that will be familiar to you as teachers. It is the image of stepping stones in a stream. This image is often used in demonstrating to students that there is a pathway to navigate through knowledge and through self-development. The image is a literal embodiment of a learning theory metaphor that was developed by Guy Claxton and outlined in his 1990 book, Teaching to Learn, A Direction for Education. Claxton made the point that progressive developmental learning involves the teacher setting down stepping stones for the learner. This means that the teacher, of course, has to fully understand where each and every student is at any given moment both intellectually and emotionally, in order to be able to position the next stone in the right place for each student. Claxton indicates that the repertoire of learning strategies possessed by learners includes many which are highly useful. Some of these are not so good in classroom situations. They are better deployed outside the classroom. He says, and I quote, if people's learning power does not develop, this is due not to a lack of ability, but to the absence of appropriate experiences and or the emotional and situational conditions which enable people to explore and extend the current boundaries of their skills as learners. I think he may be talking about when you want to do this. Or maybe even this. These activities must be understood as appropriate experiences and learning skills and they involve immersion in a situation in order to feel it and understand it. How can we give and have both the stepping stones and the thinking stream? Thinking with artists is one way when we are thinking with others who know both the stream as well as the stones, 
we can have them both. Visiting museums is a way to do that, and engaging with both art and artists is among the situational conditions that enable people to explore and extend the current boundaries of their skills as learners. It is often said that the most important lessons that students learn from good teachers is how to learn. This knowledge of how to learn, that is, how to observe, reflect, collaborate, understand, and retain that understanding, and then repeat the process. All this involves coming to an awareness of the uniqueness of one's own thought processes. It involves seeing this uniqueness as a strength to build from by acquiring other complementary thinking skills. This is really how we learn all of the great intellectual disciplines of language, literature, logic, mathematics, music, astronomy, geology, geography, natural history, visual art. So what is interdisciplinarity then, and why are artists so good at it? Let's look at this little set of rings sitting inside one another. We recognize the three great Western canonical areas of intellectual practice, the arts, the sciences, and the humanities. In many ways, all through elementary education and school, and through on to higher education even, these three rings have been kept apart and taught separately until very recently. Even now, interdisciplinarity in education is often thought of mainly as a way of engaging with different learning styles. So, for example, in teaching the mathematics of Fibonacci numbers, one could use music, for example, or a diagram that might be better for visual learners, or one can employ natural history and naturally occurring Fibonacci numbers. So this is an important way of creating affordances for a variety of learning styles by using the foothold of one discipline to give someone a stepping stone into another discipline. But it is not interdisciplinarity. It does not bring several disciplines together in order to understand something more complex, something for which each discipline knows it only has a partial understanding. Something much more complex, such as, for example, climate change. To understand and slow down climate change, you do not need only meteorologists. You need biodiversity specialists, energy technologists, environmental historians, economists, social researchers, international law experts, computational modeling technicians, <laughs> cultural anthropologists, geologists, civil engineers, chemists, politicians, political activists, urban planners, translators, hydrologists, and more. But above all, you need a process. You need a context, a methodology, through which these very different disciplines can understand each other and each other's way of working and ultimately enable them to forge entirely new methodologies of working collaboratively together in a productive way. What you need is an effective process for productive collaboration, a process. This is what I would call the problem-solving mode of interdisciplinarity in large-scale projects. This mode is actually very well outlined in a groundbreaking Danish study of interdisciplinary developments in education and research that was published in 2008. Even though it is now seven years old, it is clear, concise, comprehensive, and pragmatic, as well as innovative. All those are adjectives that I normally associate with Denmark and with Danes. 
Here is a simple diagram from the publication that shows the difference between multidisciplinarity and interdisciplinarity. In multidisciplinarity, the work group goes away from the process completely unchanged, rather like what we saw with the Fibonacci sequences using examples of nature in order to accommodate different learning styles. With interdisciplinarity, on the other hand, the process of problem solving ultimately produces an entirely new field, method, or practice. But what about when you are only one person and not a large collaborative scientific team? And what about when the problem you need to solve is one that is so philosophical in nature that no one has even noticed it yet? This is the case for artists. They train themselves to know both the thinking streams and the stepping stones and to navigate all at once. Artists do not think in a direction that is linear, that starts from one solid disciplinary base and moves out in a singular direction. Artists are intellectual explorers and maintain their agile concentration in order to be able to think in multiple directions at once, seeking ways in which concepts and issues are interrelated and to bring those invisible relations up to the surface of thought and then through the artworks that they make to bring this to the attention of the person who is observing their work. Artists move laterally across highly divergent things and ideas seeking underlying structures so deep that it can at times be hard to follow them. But as with many difficult skills, it is worth the effort. Artists choose their methods of inquiry based on where they are in their thinking streams at any given moment in the development of the project they are working on. They do not choose one tried and true investigative disciplinary method and then stick to it as in science. They will use and choose whatever tool they need to get deeper into what interests them. And they will choose materials that can show the viewer a trail, a path, through their own interdisciplinary investigation. These are some of the stepping stones through their thinking streams. And this is interdisciplinarity in micro form. Artworks at their best are highly complex distillations and syntheses of different materials, ideas, methods, contexts, and references. This makes them extremely good for teaching complex thinking, for teaching interdisciplinary thinking. In a way, teaching interdisciplinary thinking with artworks is a bit like doing what artists do, but in reverse. Observing and discussing all the elements that are present in an artwork means that in some ways you take that, that artwork apart in order to see how it works. It is here that the process and methodology of artists as interdisciplinary thinkers can reveal itself. This is where you and your students can start to learn not only new ideas but new methods of investigation. Because close attention to the different registers that signify in an artwork can also send you on different pathways of knowledge. Everything that is coherently synthesized by an artist in an artwork is also capable of pointing back towards its original discipline and towards a larger context. So I think at this point, we are ready for the first step in our geographical and intellectual trip. We're going to start very near to where we are in many ways. We're going to begin with a work by the Finnish uh, video artist Sala Tukka. So um, the work that we are about to show uh, is in the Louisiana collection and it was made in 2000. It's about four minutes long and it was shot in Finland. So we will show that now as our first stepping stone. It's fantastic to be able to see this video at Louisiana because modernist architecture plays such an important role in this work. The serene comfort of social democracy 
which is a great achievement of civilization, is somehow embodied in the domestic modernism of the homes which appear in the work and which are, of course, echoed in the modernist architecture of Louisiana itself. It is into this ordered serenity that that young man has burst, perfectly suspended with his powerful organic rope that punctures the huge, exciting hole in the familiar aesthetic that was produced in a period in the 1960s alongside optimistic social democracies, not only in Scandinavia, but elsewhere as well. The phenomenology of what he is doing with the rope appears to be the very opposite of architectural modernism, but it is happening at the same place and in the same time. He is not handsome, he's not tanned, he's not dressed in a circus costume, but his total concentration and astonishing skill are breathtaking to her and to us as well. As he moves through the lasso loop, it feels like he is leaping from one culture into another, from where he is in suburban Helsinki to where he could be in the American West and at a rodeo, perhaps. He is in two places at once, and so is she on either side of the large plate glass window. And both of the two are also suspended inside the music of Ennio Morricone's film score for the Sergio Leone film Once Upon a Time in the West. That music was written in 1968, possibly even the same year that that house was built. It is important to point out that some of the best cowboy films, the so-called spaghetti westerns, were made not by an American in America, but by an Italian in the North African landscape. And this cultural disjunction will be something Sala Tuca will have carried with her into her own work. As well as being a work about identities and personal attraction and longing in general, Lasso is an amazing artwork with which to discuss with students ways in which they can become self-aware about their own culture and immediate surroundings, and self-aware about the ways in which they view and experience distant cultures from within their own culture. And self-awareness is a pretty good place to start when you're going on an intellectual journey to another culture. So that's what we're going to do, and we're going to take the stepping stone of rodeo, and we're going to make our first leap across continents using artworks in the Louisiana collection. We're going to go to North America. This photograph by Richard Avedon is one of about 700 photographic portraits he made of people living in the western United States of America over a period of five years, from 1979 to 1984. It is of a man calling himself Joe College, a rodeo contestant, and his companion, Teresa Waldron, 14 years old. It was taken in Sydney, Iowa, on the 11th of August of 1979. Avedon has made the point of putting Teresa Waldron's age, very young indeed, into the artwork by including it in that title. It looks as if Avedon as well was someone somewhat shocked by this. I don't really want to say that this couple is more real than the couple in Salatuka's video, because both couples have a different but equal quality of powerful presence and ambiguous relationship. But I will say that Joe and Teresa cut through any romantic idea of the American West as being a land of opportunity and they give an intense sense of the hardship and poverty that lurks behind the American dream and even the spaghetti western. This set of western portraits made by Avedon was a big surprise at the time, especially as he was better known for celebrity portraits. In the intervening 35 years, we've become more familiar, especially recently, with the truth about widening economic disparity inside apparently highly successful first world economies. And these photographs also afford the opportunity to talk with students about economic disparity, not only in the States, but also in other highly developed economies, such as in Denmark. So what was Joe College doing as a rodeo contestant? These images will give you some of an idea. 
Highly stylized and incredibly dangerous for both man and animal, rodeo is now a big business sport in North America, both in Canada, where I come from, and in the States. Avedon put into his photograph of Teresa and Joe everything that was in his thinking stream and also everything that stood before him. Inequalities between rich and poor, men and girls, urban and rural, and somewhere in the background, inequalities between humans and animals. These are, of course, and there are, of course, other inequalities to address if we're looking at the rodeo, because there are cowboys, but there are also Indians. In her short essay of 1985 about working with Avedon on the American West Portrait Project, Laura Wilson says, and I quote, we did not see Indians that looked like the ones in the portraits of Edward Curtis, steadfast, noble, and unbroken. The Navajo, Ute, Apache, and Crow tribes all have severe problems with alcoholism. Nobody, it seems, quite knows why. Some attribute the problem to the reservation life itself, the isolation, lack of jobs, broken homes, and dependence on welfare. To many Indians with whom we spoke, the possibility of success in contemporary America seems remote. This work, which is again in the Louisiana collection, is by the artist Jimmy Durham, who was born a Wolf Clan Cherokee Indian in Arkansas in 1940. Durham is a highly respected senior figure in both the contemporary art world and the world of activism around the rights of indigenous peoples. He's also a brilliant satirist and uses ironic humor in his work. He loves language and puns, and this often shows in his work. So let's take a close look at this piece and see if we can take it apart to see how it ticks. Let's do what the artist has done, but in reverse, to see how he has used different disciplines and registers to make a point here. So the title of this sculpture is actually a list of some of the materials used in the making of the sculpture itself. Cotton canvas and polyvinyl chloride. Polyvinyl chloride is a thermoplastic made using a considerable proportion of fossil fuel oil. And it's also used in everything from flooring to piping. Obviously, the title portion uh, actually relates to the big plastic tube. Cotton canvas is used for everything from sheets and artists' painting canvases to shirts, such as this shirt. Whose shirt is this? Is it Jimmy's shirt? Is it, so to speak, the shirt off his back? This phrase in American slang, the shirt off my back, refers to instances when something is so expensive as to an individual that it has even cost them the shirt off their own back. Jimmy's shirt appears now to be wrapped around the tube as if it was a horse blanket or a saddle. The comparison between the rodeo horse and the rider doesn't really stop there. The wooden trestles that hold up the tubing are the kind that a contract builder would use to put a piece of wood on to cut it in two. And in English, they're called saw horses. Suddenly we can really see the riderless horse that this sculpture forms. It also has a bit of an industrial look, and that's underscored by the title. What industries use this kind of tubing? Well, one use of this kind of tubing is in pipelines. Oil <coughs> pipelines. Snaking through large areas of North America on supporting trestles or horses. Large areas of North America, some of which is still contested territory, land that was either taken from, promised to, or treaty bargained for with the indigenous peoples who have lived there for thousands of years longer than any colonizers from the 17th, 18th, or 19th century. Currently, there is considerable activism by indigenous people contesting the commercial extraction of oil from Indian land and the routes that pipelines take across Indian land. So Jimmy Durham's work is about a ghost horse 
long gone, and its replacement with strange fossil fuel technologies, oil-powered vehicles that require the desecration of land and environment, and that literally cost the shirt off their backs of disenfranchised indigenous people as the pipelines are railroaded across <coughs> contested territories. He's done this with language, humor, puns, materials, formal metaphor, and a simple presentation that you could even imagine getting on and having a ride. We can see what he has done and how he has done it, how he has done it. He helps us to reconfigure all those elements in a new way that reveals underlying structure. We can also follow this artwork to the pressing issues about fossil fuels, and indeed to fossils themselves, if we want to come around to geology. So what is oil? Do you talk about this with your students? How is it formed? This is an important question if we are seeking to understand the economic and environmental contexts that Durham's sculpture sits within and speaks about. For this, we need to do a little natural history, a little geology. <coughs> Oil is formed from the organic remains of prehistoric animals who lived many hundreds of thousands of years ago. And this is our time travel bit. That's why oil is called a fossil fuel, because it is in liquid form just as much a fossil as anything you can find impressed in stone. Other forms of fossil fuel, such as coal, are made from fossil plants, where the carbon caught in the plants, when alive, condenses into pure graphites. And if you want to take your students on the physics as well as the biology travel tra trail, you can ta talk to them about the atomic structural differences between different kinds of graphites, including coal and diamonds. Coal, of course, is soft and dull, opaque and common. Diamonds are hard, brilliant, transparent, and very rare. Rather like oil, they're formed deep in the earth, and their rarity, also like oil, makes them a valuable commodity and they are often traded illegally. There is in the world a particular problem with what are called conflict diamonds. These are diamonds that are illicitly mined and traded, often for the benefit of factions in civil wars, and which until recently had no regulatory practice to distinguish them from legally mined diamonds. It means, as the Global Witness site tells us, that the trade in minerals can fund conflict and violence, and these minerals can end up in your mobile phone, your laptop, your car, and the jewelry you wear. The Democratic Republic of Congo is one of the highest risk areas for conflict minerals, where it is well known that warring sides in the civil war are funding their military strength and ability to kill each other through the sale of illicitly mined and traded minerals. These mines can be found in landscapes rather like this. This photograph, taken with infrared detecting film, is by Richard Moss, and it was taken in the Democratic Republic, Republic of Congo in 2010. Its title is Nowhere to Run, and it is now on display in the Louisiana Museum. So we've come a long way today, but finally we have reached Africa now. We are in Africa and in the Louisiana Museum. We have come here along the thinking streams of artists and we have used their stepping stones too. We have been to Helsinki, Iowa, Alaska and the Congo. We've been to the center of the earth and we've been to prehistoric biology. We've looked at individual identities as well as self-awareness. We've looked at the impact of colonial histories and of technological developments. We have considered architecture, photography, language, film, and fine art. We have touched on mathematics, geology, mineralogy, natural history, meteorology, circus, and rodeo. We've looked at materials such as oil, diamonds, coal, cotton, and polyvinyl chloride. We've been to a number of conflict zones. We've been to economic inequality. We've been to the zone of environmental rights and indigenous people's rights. 
We've been to that place where tensions exist between the sexes and between those living in cities and in the countryside. We've been many places, but most importantly, the most important place we have been in is interdisciplinary thinking, where material things and abstract ideas from a number of different registers are conjoined in ways that show new connections, offer new methods of analysis, and new ways of using the well-structured disciplines that we already have. In my opinion, it is as important for students to understand this intellectual process of working across and through disciplines as it is for them to understand the discipline bases themselves. So when we think about working with artists to teach and learn interdisciplinarity, it's just as much the artist's process that we must be interested in as the subjects that they are thinking about and working on. And I believe that is just what Hannah Flarup will be talking to us about when, in a few short minutes, we go to see the exhibition of photographs and film by Richard Moss here at Louisiana. Thank you. <laughs>